안고있죠 Thank you, Mr. President. Some are going to look thin. Good afternoon, Your Honours. Some to be so looks like a crumb. Some to be so looks a stracha chandler. We were discussing before the break the classification of the population post April 1975. And the ways in which um, you have discussed the treatment of these people. Continuing on from that point, what I would like to discuss next is your analysis of the four-year plan for the which, uh, of course, uh, is uh, discussed or reproduced in the book that Judge Cartwright referred to yesterday, your, your, uh, the book you co-edited, um, Pol Plans the Future. Um, what I would like to look at now is, uh, as, I, as I said, your analysis of that plan and some of the conclusions that you, that you drew. And just for everyone's benefit, this is, uh, the, the analysis of this plan um, uh, is contained in the book Brother Number One, which is E3 slash 117, um, and it is also uh, contained in Professor Chandler's other books, uh, uh, including the History of Cambodia, um, which is the book I wish to. Um, look at now. Uh, Professor Chandler, um, if you could uh, go to pages uh, 214 to 216 of the book, and I'll read out the relevant ERNs. The Khmer ERN is 0067915257. To seven seven. The English ERN is zero zero four two two eight four two. Um, in brother number one, you um, indicate indicate that the plan was uh, introduced by Pol Pot in August. But here uh, we are moving to um, a uh, uh, the contents of the plan, if you like, your, your views uh, and analysis of the contents. So at, the, at those ERNs in the history of Cambodia, you say the following. It called for the collectivization of all Cambodian property and proposed ever-increasing levels of rice production throughout the country with the aim of achieving an average national yield of three metric tons per hectare, or 1.4 ton per, per acre. The pre-revolutionary average harvested under less stringent conditions and with monetary incentives had been less than a ton per hectare, one of the lowest in Southeast Asia. A few lines below that, you state the following. The plan had been hastily written. There was no time to conduct studies to see if its proposals were appropriate to soil and water conditions in particular areas, or if the infrastructure needed for other programs was in place. Instead, 
the plan called for an, quote, all-out storming offensive, end quote, by all the people. Um, and two more brief passages uh, continuing on in the same text. So just further down, quote, no material incentives were offered the Cambodian people except the bizarre promise that everyone would enjoy dessert on a daily basis by 1980, exclamation mark. A little bit further down, again, where you talk about the concept of accomplishing this swiftly, uh, I quote, in explaining the plan to high-ranking members of the party, an unnamed spokesman presumably Pol Pot stated that the plan could be accomplished swiftly. The, the DK revolution, after all, was a new experience, an important one for the whole world, because we don't perform like others. And this here is quoting the language. Uh, of the regime. We leap directly to a socialist revolution and swiftly build socialism. We don't need a long period of time for transformation. Could I ask you to um, expand briefly on your conclusion that there was no time to collect, to conduct studies, that no studies were conducted, and that instead the plan uh, called for, a, for an all-out storming offensive by the people. Thank Well, the, the plan, like many other policies uh, set in place in uh, <coughs> democratic Cambodia, was sprang from foregone conclusions rather than any uh, examination of possibilities or potentialities of, of the uh, policy uh, taking effect. <coughs> I mean, just as they, no, oh, neither be. But at the beginning of the, the introductory paragraph to the plan is our, our, the, was the explanation, which you have incited, the Pope says, in a kind of typical, I think, rather typical DK fashion, uh, why do we need the plan? Because we need the plan. His answer is we need it because we need it. No question of discussion or anybody said we don't need one, whatever. We need it immediately. Another reason he didn't mention, of course, is we need it because this is what revolutionary regimes do when they come to power, they set in motion plans. Usually after a while, not, not immediately, not, not within a, uh, this is within well, the plan was supposed to come in about a year and a bit after coming to power. It was drawn up much less, much earlier than that. Uh, <coughs> drawn up from, as I say, wishful thinking and foregone conclusions about the way things had to occur in uh, DK under the leadership of the, uh, under what they call the clairvoyant leadership of the uh, CPK. Um, I think they were imitating, with, they never cite the, uh, the models they're copying. As a matter of fact, the three tons per hectare I found out, uh, I stumbled across when I was uh, writing the Voice from S21, turned out to have been a policy introduced in a, one of the model areas of China in the early 1970s to the same point of done with Mu instead of hectare, but it comes out to the same. So it was a, a model that came from China, so did the phrase, the, the uh, great leap forward they used a lot came from China without saying that it did. But the idea that <coughs> Cambodia's riches were in agriculture was true, uh, that its potential uh, lay, at least the way they could see it at the time, not being too certain, for example, of the oil deposits which have only been guaranteed very recently, uh, uh, that agriculture would in the future be the source of income for Cambodia. The plan, in a, in a way, makes a kind of a kind of sense. What it doesn't do, of course, as I tried to say uh, before, and uh, it doesn't take consideration for what was actually going on in 75 and 76, just as it doesn't pay attention to the failure of the Great Leap Forward or, or such other events outside of Cambodia. It's built on hope. It's built on the assumption that the liberated energies of the poor, uh, as it were, taking a lid off the uh, oppressed, oppressed lives that they allegedly have been leaving, would be enough to uh, fuel, uh, to, to be the, the uh, fuel the engine of the revolution and produce these uh, targets. I think the uh, 
There's lots of things in the in the plan that can be talked about, but, uh, such as they were going to get uh, if they, if we have oil, we will find it stuff like that. The main thing was to impose a, a dream really a, a dream onto the Cambodian people of this kind of level of production. It's of course complete uh, speculation which is a, you know, off, off, off base a bit but had the target been set at two tons per hectare quite a lot more success might have been achieved. Three was, three was out, out, of, out of reach. Pop Pot didn't think so but it turned out to be completely out of reach for most of the country. And briefly could you because we're discussing here a speech uh, attributed to Pol Pot. Um, could you tell us if you have been able to conclude um, which body or, or whether it was an individual or a group of people um, issued the plan? I'd have to recheck the text, what I, what, I, what I said at the time. It certainly wasn't a document originating from Pol Pot personally. It, was, it, it emerged from the party leadership. It was a, I think it was a composite, uh, composite draft. There were some, uh, some writers who suggested that parts of it were written by Q. Sampan, but I'm not saying that. It was written by, it's collectively written, certainly, uh, collectively approved, uh, coming out of the collective leadership. Uh, and it was a... Again, you never get a single, a single signature on any DK documents. So. But only the leader can explain, and only the leader has had the final word. So uh, it comes out of this collective mentality, collective leadership, uh, which must be centered at some point in the Central Committee, but we don't have that specific information. <coughs> Thank you. And as far as you have been able to glean, um, how was, well, first of all, was that plan communicated to people who would then implement it? No, as far as we know, it, it was not. It was never, never put into effect. The uh, reason why it was not put into effect is uh, the specific reason is not known, but it, it I suggests that it's connected with the sort of tidal shunt that took place in the Cambodian Communist Party toward the end of 1976, uh, September, October, in that area, in that period the, of, their, of their rule. Uh, it was withdrawn from, uh, it was never widely circulated, and it was withdrawn from, uh, from uh, execution. Although the slogan three tons per hectare continued through the regime, through the end of the regime. Um, the, uh, let me just think what I was thinking. Um, no, just go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you. In, in so far as the three tons per hectare slogan continued to be used, did it have any uh, effect on the implementation of policies and practices throughout the country? Well, I, I think certainly it, it certainly frightened people. It frightened the people who were, who were supposed to carry it out. This would be the uh, cadre district and sector and zone leaders in the countryside who had to produce these, these uh, targets. Uh, to what extent they actually produced the targets, we don't know the information. At least I don't think the information is available. It wasn't available to me at the, when I wrote the book. But <clears throat> there's quite a lot of evidence that in order to get even close to the targets, they cut back on the amounts of rice that was supposed to be set aside for seeds and for feeding the population in order to deliver a sufficient amount up, up the line. And as I said, uh, in one of my somewhere, I just was reviewing it yesterday, um, the, there's an irony uh, uh, tied in with the whole idea of self Cambodian self-sufficiency and not failure to rely on foreign aid. It's ironic that several hundred thousand tons of rice were exported to China at this time to pay them for the unacknowledged aid that they were giving. In other words, the Cambodians were trying to showed that they were producing surpluses when they weren't to the Chinese as a matter of uh, fraternal solidarity and so on. Uh, <coughs> all over the country and all kinds of evidence you get, the evidence of food supply going down, nutrition going down, uh, starvation coming up, or deaths from malnutrition going up, all connected, I think, to the kind of uh, scare qualities of this three-ton 
how he couldn't target. hear when he could it, it was a target that was just always stressed and never denied, and it was too much to make, too much for the people to produce. Now, moving on to um, one particular region that you looked at, uh, and this is now in brother number one, uh, and the relevant ERNs in Kino, Professor Chandra, if you're looking Look at hard copy, it should be page Chandra, 117 of Brother Number One. Uh, uh, all ERN in English. 0093130313. Have you been able to find that passage? It should be added with. I'll I will read it. I'll read it. Quote, <coughs> most of the work in the North West <coughs> would be done by more than one million April 17 people who had been evacuated from Phnom Penh and from the city of Batamba into rural areas in the zone. Over the next two years, these men and women were forced to hack rice fields, canals, dams and villages out of malarial forests. Tens of thousands of them died from malnutrition, disease, executions, and overwork. These deaths, when they became known, distressed the authorities in Phnom Penh only to the extent that they indicated that, quote, enemies, end quote, were at work behind the scenes. New people, because they were so numerous and, quote, class enemies, End quote, of the revolution were expendable. Many survivors recall a chilling aphorism directed mockingly at them by Cadre. Quote, Keeping you is no gain, losing you is no loss. End of quote. I would, first of all, Professor, um, if you could. Some low. Tell us what evidence you looked at in arriving at the conclusions of tens of thousands of deaths in this particular region. One of the main uh, sources for information about the uh, conditions in the Northwest were uh, refugee testimonies after the war. Uh, a large number of the refugees who got into Thailand came from that area and <coughs> many of them as new people were uh, educated uh, uh, to a certain level where they would find themselves in a position to give detailed and articulate uh, uh, descriptions of what had happened. Uh, <coughs> the casualty figures are uh, taken from a couple of uh, books uh, which are just estimates, there are no formal uh, uh, estimates of the casualties under DK and in, in these different zones. One of the points of the Northwest, as well as being filled with uh, new people, was it was not an area that had been under systematic uh, Khmer Rouge control during the Civil War. This meant that uh, there were not as many well-trained or competent or screened, whatever word you want to use, uh, local cadre to handle the population. A situation very different in the southwest, different in large parts of the east, in the northeast, and even in some of the areas around uh, Phnom Penh in the center and north of the country. This was a frontier to which uh, new people have been sent, and also cadre often with no connection to this part of the country. It's very important because in great many parts of the country, the Khmer Rouge leaders of a local area would be from that local area. And this doesn't mean that they'd be uh, especially uh, just or or, uh, or soft, but they knew conditions, they knew, they knew people to work with, they could gather. In the Northwest, where Kedri, who had not come from there, uh, had little experience in administering, uh, and were then, once you've expended, if you like, enough of the uh, new people, uh, the regime decided that these 
Uh, we're the enemies, uh, really, not the unproductive new people, but the cadre that had been sent there to run the show were the, the ones who wrecked it. This all comes from the uh, absolute se the, the, the sense that the Communist Party has, has, the soul, has monopoly over, over the truth. In other words, it can never be uh, wrong. Therefore, there's no question of saying from the center, oh, that policy was wrong. Therefore, we must change the policy. No, the policy was right. <laughs> so there has to be some other reason for its failure as opposed to its intrinsic shortcomings. And these were exactly the same uh, strategies followed by Stalin. These were blamed on wreckers and various people who just couldn't do the right thing. And where you um, uh, discuss the, the movement by of more than one million people, April 17 people, uh, um, from Phnom Penh to that region, um, have you been able to um, ascertain whether that was a result of, um, or rather, I'll, I'll put my questions differently. Uh, uh, have you been able to uh, ascertain uh, which decision or decisions um, related to that particular movement? Without the precision that might be helpful if I had the sources right in front of me, but the, the, the passage suggests that the new people, suggests mistakenly that the new people evacuated to the Northwest had been sent there from Tampan. Now, these were people evacuated from Tampan to various places and then gathered up at the beginning of 76 and sent up to the Northwest by truck and train and sometimes on foot. This is called the second evacuation, if this is called that, it's in all the, in the literature. So, very few of the new people, well, correct that, new people from Batabang, which is a recently Cambodian second city, were all evacuated into the northwest. So this situation began to occur, and a refugee I spoke to in 76 who fled then uh, in, the, in the optimistic period uh, was one of several hundred who jumped off out of the northwest quickly when it uh, was starting to new people. And these formed the basis for the uh, first interviews with refugees. Anyway, most of these people were, went to provinces near Phnom Penh where they had relatives because most people in Phnom Penh in those days either had come from these regions anyway or had relatives in them. So they would be in the southwest, the east, the south, uh, no, there's no south, the east and the, and the center. But they were gathered up to go, once this plan is starting to get thought of, they are gathered up and moved into the Northwest as a, well, as a, you can call it a slave labor force or just a, a cutting edge in order you want to use. These are the people who had to do the work. There weren't enough people up there to achieve this three tons per hectare. Where were the extra people? Well, they were the city people, obviously. But up they went to the Northwest. So the phrasing evacuated from Phnom Penh in, in the paragraph is not really I wrote it, but it's not, not exactly right. And just to, to for the avoidance of any doubt, you described that, that movement of people from a number of regions in early 1976. Um, Where did that decision emanate from? If there was a decision, uh, 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 oh, I mean, from, from the party center, this was, it was connected with the whole uh, policy plan to, that ended up producing this four-year plan. This was all part of their strategy. It was not uh, decided. Nothing of this dimension was ever ad hoc in Cambodia. It was always right from the top. Thank you. And lastly, on, on this uh, passage, um, you've indicated that um, you interviewed survivors and some of this information is, is based on those interviews. Um, are you able to, to expand on this aphorism? Keeping you is no gain, losing you is no loss. How that was um, applied, if it was applied, in what, what effect did you have in practice? 
The effect it had in practice was to scare the people to whom it was directed. This was the purpose of it. Uh, uh, it was quoted so often, quite early on in the people starting research on the Khmer Rouge in 8081 with survivors and with people living inside the country, still living inside uh, Cambodia after the uh, collapse of the Khmer Rouge. So widespread, this was just almost a slogan for the, what do we tell the new people? Tell them this. I mean, there's, there's no, no evidence that order, but this came all over the country. People had this slogan. It was in their ears. It, it meant, or it rang in their ears, you are worthless. But <laughs> if you want to survive, just work extremely hard, and we'll decide from day to day what happens to you. It's, it's a terrifying slogan. Uh, it was very, very widespread. I heard, I heard it myself many, many times from, from survivor, people, survivors of the regime. Thank you. Moving on to um, uh, the issue of um, deaths or estimated deaths, numbers of deaths during uh, the 1975 Obviously, you've studied this uh, for many years, and so there are a number of references, um, and I will give you two, uh, to your own uh, consideration of this. Uh, number uh, in the tragedy of Cambodian history at English ERN 0042 you, uh, we, for this, we appear to also have a Khmer reference. There have been partial. No, I do apologize. Um, this is only available in, 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 in English. Um, I just want to check and make sure that I have the correct ERNs here. Um, so looking at the tragedy, the correct ERNs, uh, I'll just read them out to make sure that we have the correct uh, 0193084 in English. And in Khmer, uh, it does appear that we have a Khmer, uh, except for this 0082099. You, you state the following, quote, under the regime of democratic Cambodia, a million Cambodians or one complete died from warfare, starvation, overwork, misdiagnosed diseases, and executions. That was in the tragedy of Cambodian history. You revisit the issue in a history of Cambodia. Uh, and just for the record, that was D366-7.1.1.1. And um, you give the following estimate. Although Vietnamese anti-DK propaganda was often heavy-handed and inaccurate, even cautious estimates of DK-related deaths caused by overwork, starvation, mistreated diseases, purges and executions came close to 2 million Cambodians or 1 in 5. That second book was, uh, is, is an addition from the year 2000 um, and there is obviously a difference in estimates. Uh, would you care to expand on how you arrive at those figures and uh, whether uh, you still consider the estimates uh, given the history of Cambodia to be accurate? Uh, yes, I, I consider the later estimate to be my later, my later estimate. I mean, uh, this is taking advantage of a lot of interesting demographic work that was done, none of it by me, but so I'm, and I'm also joining, I was given uh, just now this uh, 
Demographic expert report. I was supposed to have that, I suppose, was I? No, if, if you don't mind, don't, don't look at that. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, so just I didn't see it. Uh, but the point is, a consensus uh, developed between in the early 2000s about the level of deaths drawing on these same demographic sources that I had used. Uh, their books and articles that I choose. So I joined the consensus not having the skills to calibrate up or calibrate down. In, con in conversations I've had since then, there are people whom I trust but don't want to just quote that now the evidence looks to be that it might be higher, it might be approaching closer to 2 million than 1.5. But I've stuck to 1.517 because that's, well, once they received wisdom, that's a phrase, but <laughs> it's what people are, are agreed on at the moment, and I'd be perfectly happy to change those figures if better information came to, came to hand. Thank you very much. Just for, uh, for everyone's benefit, uh, I, I considered um, also showing you the demogra demo a demographic expert report, um, but in the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, I think you've explained your conclusion, and that's sufficient for our purposes. Um, I thank you. Um, I now wish to move on to... Thank you, Mr. President. Just to make sure um, that we get the meaning of what just happened, I was not clear on uh, what documents Professor Chandler wanted to uh, discuss and whether or not he had looked at the contents. His initial remarks seemed to indicate that he had. He then later said that he did not read it. I don't uh, want to expect any foul play, but maybe the prosecution can clarify this because, again, it's about the sources of knowledge of uh, Mr. Chandler uh, that we talk here today as well. Mr. President, I think it's a fair comment um, by my learned friend. Um, the document which was in our bundle um, and which we were considering uh, showing Mr. Professor Chandler um, is the demographic expert report, uh, which is, of course, on the case file. Uh, for the record, uh, the document number is D140. And perhaps to avoid any uh, or for any, any uh, doubt, no we can ask the professor um, uh, whether. Um, well, let's just take it one step at a time. Uh, did you look at the figures in that report? Uh, I don't think I did. I mean, I was given it, I thought I could read. I was never been given anything I was supposed to read, so I don't feel I've committed any sort of mistake. But on the other hand, I didn't examine it in detail. What I did look at, I must say, without examining everything in detail, was the end to see the conclusion. And the conclusion showed in the footnote, I think this can go on the record, this document, a consensus that had developed from a variety of sources in the, in the footnote. It cites several sources, and these would be the ones that I, I mentioned that I'm in agreement with. Now, if I examined the document officially, I would have had to say, you know, if it was different, I'd have to say what my own conclusion was still. It's not going to be changed by this document. What I saw was they referred to this consensus that I did refer to, so I said, you know, that's fine. That, and, uh, which is 1.5 to 1.7 kind of thing, million, that's, I mean, it's an awful figure, but, you know. And that's really what we're, what we're, uh, okay. what we're uh, seeking to elicit is, is your own independent uh, conclusions. Um, there was no mistake on your part, Professor Chandler. It was inadvertently given to you if, because it was at the back of another document. Um, but we have your, uh, your own conclusions, and, and that, that suffices. As I said, I wish to move on to yet another topic. Um, and it is uh, related in part to um, some of the questions that you were asked by Judge Cartwright yesterday. Um, it, it deals with uh, Broadly speaking, the uh, appointments to various bodies, um, 
during the democratic Kampuchea regime. And what I would like to uh, begin with is another quote from uh, one of your books. Uh, we're going back to brother number one. Uh, we have this uh, in Khmer, so if it could be shown on the screen, uh, that would be appreciated. It is E3-17. The Khmer ERN is 00821773-4. The English ERN is 00393021022. It's really just your your um, treatment of the relationship between the party and other bodies that I'm interested in. And this is what you said. If we could show the Khmer version on the screen, that, that would be appreciated. Quote, the party concealed by the faca facade of the revolutionary organization, in brackets, the name it had assumed among Cambodians, was still officially hidden behind the National Front, with Sihanouk ostensibly the chief of state. Layers of disguises, revolutionary names, and secret meetings protected, protected South Sa from the judgment of ordinary people. Party members who had been assigned new responsibilities took up their work in secret, disguised by revolutionary names. The complex charade hid the real division of spoils, whereby high-ranking members of the party carved out areas of patronage and control. Firstly, if I can ask you, <laughs> Professor Chandler, um, whether you considered um, uh, internal documents, standing committee minutes and the like, which, which deal with, with that period, uh, and, and I'm discussing here uh, 75, before we get to that decision we discussed yesterday. Yes. Yes, you, you, well, you can assume that. Now, what you, um, perhaps in, in hindsight, the question was perhaps unnecessary. Uh, as we go through these passages, uh, there is additional information. Uh, you, you do uh, look at the October 1975 uh, standing committee minutes, and you, uh, go through the minutes and you, you uh, note uh, certain appointments um, and I think this was this may have been discussed so I apologize if I'm covering uh, ground that's already been covered. Um, you you uh, indicate the comrade deputy secretary Nguyen Chia was responsible for party organizational work and education and Ying Siri was to handle foreign affairs for the state and the party. Khi San Pan remained as liaison officer with the National Front, that is, with Sihanouk, and he was also given the task of the accountancy and pricing aspects of commerce, recalling his cabinet post in the 1960s. As, as far as your research has indicated, uh, again, in part, you may have already answered this, but perhaps not in, in, in entirely, um, were these roles uh, indeed performed by the accused during the DK period? Yes, they were. I would <coughs> alter the wording slightly of that passage now with the hindsight, of course. I think the phrase that I used there, carved out, is a little harsh. I think what they had is they had a group of people who had certain capacities. And I think they looked, in a way, I mean, this is to, I don't mean to give them a lot of credit, but it's more understandable than that phrase carved out would suggest, which would suggest just a kind of gangster group. The person with experience in foreign affairs had been 
Ian Suri. Ian Suri had, had a lot of experience in educating party cadre this come out in his autobiography and other places. Uh, Kissam had, had this commercial portfolio uh, that he performed very well when he was, he was a very conscientious uh, cabinet member for Sihanouk in the 60s, he had knowledge of that sort of issue. So these uh, people were not picked at random. Uh, they were, this is the, I guess you would say the best invite us. This is what they had. Uh, Truett had to teach them teaching experience, so she was over in that social, social affairs. Area. People got assigned. Uh, Sun Sen had been an active combat combatant. He's a started life as an anthropologist, but during the Civil War, he shown talent as a military leader, so he was skipped. So I've just taken back the phrase carved out because it's not really fair. It's as if it's, they, did, they gave these positions at the dis, for the disadvantage of more competent people. That's not, it's, it's poorly worded. They, it's really a fairly, given the materials, it was the best they could do. So it was a set of choices. <coughs> and Moving on from so that no. October 1975 uh, uh, document and those decisions, um, I, I want to briefly go through the process of uh, adoption and promulgation of the constitution of, of democratic Kampuchea, uh, in other words, the, the birth of the state itself. As, as far as um, your research takes you, Professor, um, and considering our earlier discussion about the, the front and the existence of the front as well as a, a government, um, were those bodies active um, as at or post April 1975? Did they continue to perform any, any executive role as far as your research uh, indicates? I would say almost none. It was a, a, a continuing facade. I mean, Sihanouk came down, came back to Cambodia as the so-called chief of state and was driven around an empty city and, and then was uh, told to go on a trip to here and there and do these various jobs. Uh, Kisampan was liaised with him and was uh, uh, played the role that he was supposed to play as being the liaison with, with uh, Sihanouk. But uh, pretty clear by then the game was up. I mean, Sihanouk, I said earlier, very good social and political antennae, and he could see that he was really not the chief of state anymore. It was just a, but he had no actions that he could take. So I would say the actions that took place by the, by the ruling party between April 65 and 75 and the promulgation of the Constitution in, I think it was January 76, uh, were just done in secret and, and carried out the way they wanted to do it. It was not without, there were no laws, of course, but without any kind of um, open discussion of what was going on. Thank you. So then looking at the, the process of the adoption of the Constitution, um, there are a number of uh, publicly available records on this and some CPK documents, so um, I'd like to, to consider uh, a couple of them. Um, document E3 slash 273 is a Foreign Broadcast Information uh, Service transcript of a report attributed to Mr. Q. Sampan on the draft of the Constitution that is dated the 14th of December 1975. Professor Chandler, have you in your research um, come across um, Foreign Broadcast Information Service um, transcripts from, from this period. Oh, I certainly have. They're one of the major sources of internal knowledge of this, uh, this country to up to 78. And I'm familiar with this particular one also. I, I do not remember citing it, I think. <coughs> Thank you. Um, your Honours, uh, if Look we could uh, display it on the screen, um, the English ERN is 00657439240. 
the French ERN is 0025796297 and the English is 0016781111. What we can do is show the Khmer version on the screen and we will hand the professor a hard copy. Professor, if you could look at um, in your copy of the versions where the ERNs end with digits 9, 6 and 9, 7. This uh, document uh, reports uh, a, 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 on, a, uh, on a congress which was, um, which was held uh, according to the document at the end of April 1975. Um, and then the, the, the events which followed that, that Congress um, were as follows. This resolution of the Special National Congress is the basic essence of our Constitution itself. Uh, two lines below that. The Special National Congress set up a Constitutional Commission in charge of preparing a written draft of the Constitution. The Constitutional Commission of the Special National Congress then held successive meetings to discuss the draft and finally decided on a draft Constitution, which was then submitted to thorough examination and consideration by the Council of Ministers. The Council of Ministers then submitted to the Commission its suggestions for amendments to the draft សូមគោលលោកបទិនសូមអនុញ្ញាតឲ្យសាបរិយញ្ញាសួរសាកសេចជំនាញថាតើលោកបានស្គាល់ឯកសារពីមុនមកទេពូកណារៀបរាប់
this makes it sound like a very step-by-step uh, you know, uh, -step, uh, thing with lots of advice thoughts from all sorts of parties. And what we've heard all day and yesterday, this is not the CPK way of proceeding. So I have my doubts about this reflecting the reality, but again, they're just doubts. They're not anything further than that. Thank you. Following the adoption of the Constitution, um, the uh, documents uh, uh, which I will show you um, report on elections uh, reportedly held on the 20th of March. Uh, the next document which deals with this is E3 slash 274, and as I said, it, it is a report on the elections. Um, it's another FIBIS extract, and we can pass a copy to the professor. Um, the relevant ERNs are Khmer 00700118, French ERN, which I understand is an incomplete translation, is 00700112, and English 00167986. Now, I don't propose to uh, go into great detail in this document, um, but at those ERNs that I just read out, uh, it states the 20th March elections were successfully carried out with all of our people aged 18 years and up casting their ballots with enthusiasm. The, result, the results from all polling stations throughout the country are as follows. It then proceeds to give um, some figures and uh, I'll spare the interpreters um, uh, going through them, but it concludes that 98% of the eligible voters participated in the election. Again, if we can refer to your research uh, of the period of your interviews with, with survivors uh, and, and other sources you looked at, um, are you aware of evidence of elections being held and participated in by 98% of the population? Well, <clears throat> that's 90% of the eligible voters, and the new people were not allowed to vote. So this means 98% of the presumably base people, military people. I think it's inconceivable that this number of people could have voted in, a, in an election in Cambodia at this, at this stage of its communications and its stage of its infrastructure. 98% uh, uh, in, in, in the most uh, thorough elections in Cambodian history under one tack you got up to, I think, 70%. It's 98%. I mean, so there's something very inaccurate. Of course, you have high party cadre listed as factory workers here as candidates. Another wonderful anomaly is that 520 candidates, 250 people elected. No sense of who the losers were, how the choices were made. Some people remember uh, uh, going to the election. Sinuk himself voted. Uh, well, I mean, he, otherwise he'd say that he didn't, there was no election, he didn't vote, so he, he voted. Some of the areas voted. There's some, it was very spotty, but certainly it, uh, it, this does not reflect uh, electoral, electoral politics were then abandoned. There was no, this never returned. I think, again, this is largely for popular, for, for overseas consumption. It's to, it's to show that this is an orderly transition of power from the, the front organization to this new, the new uh, regime. Uh, but the elections themselves, I, I think, you can't give any real credence to them, in my mind. Thank you. Um, now I would like to look at the document which you discussed with uh, Judge Cartwright yesterday. This is the decision of the Central Committee uh, of the 30th of March 1976, document E3-12. Um, and 
we have a, we have a hard copy, Professor. Um, for you, with President, with your permission. Thank you. What, what we will endeavour to do is, as we go to any new document, we'll, we'll provide you a hard copy and hopefully uh, we'll keep track of what, what we've provided. Um, now, what I'm interested in is um, at English ERN 00182813. In Khmer, it is at 00003140. And the same passage in French at 00224366. It is a uh, discussion uh, of the uh, establishment of state institutions. And I just wish to read um, one part of it. If we could show that on the screen in Khmer, thank you. Um, the, the passage that I wish to read, Professor, is as follows. It may be difficult for you to, to follow on the screen in Khmer. Um, the true nature of our state organization at this time is different from before. Previously, the, the true nature was a front, capital F, not now. They are the state organizations totally of our party. Must have all state organizations have true representative characteristics with sufficient influence both in the party and in the country and outside the country. This is a political offensive as well. Does that passage reflect your understanding of the, the practice or the, the practice differ um, from what is stated in this decision? Oh, I think that's absolutely in line with what they were doing. This is a, this is a document by the insiders about what they were doing. There's, there's no reason to lie to each other. This is, uh, this is a truth-telling document. Now, moving on to the Constitution itself, and just looking at a couple of provisions, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on this. Article 5 of the Constitution deals with legislative power, and the first sentence of that article says, legislative power is invested in the representative assembly of the people, workers, peasants, and all other Kampuchean la laborers. And, and it mentions the number of 250 members which you referred to. The document that we looked at earlier, the report attributed to Mr. Kusam Pan, E3-273, the report of the Constitution, states the following. The Constitution stipulates that this law-making power should be given to the Assembly of People's Representatives, which is elected directly by the people, as indicated in Article 6. In fact, this law-making power is given to the Assembly to establish various political lines for both the internal and external policies of the country. And before I ask you uh, some questions, Professor Chandler, against the backdrop of those, of those uh, provisions and the report, if we could look at a, uh, a minute of the Standing Committee, uh, this is document E3-232. It is dated the 8th of March, 1976. Um, the relevant page uh, in Khmer is ERN 0017118, in English 0018263030, in French 0032393. If we could have that document on the screen. Thank you. Now,
what I wish to um, focus on, what I wish to focus on is a comment in this document uh, which, sa which states as follows. Quote, if anyone asks, we must explain, not be wild and disorderly, do not, do not let it be seen that we want to suppress. At the same time, do not, do not speak playfully about the assembly in front of the people to let them see that we are deceptive and our assembly is worthless. In fact, it still remains the task of the party. Considering that provision of the Constitution and then these comments, um, Professor, do the comments reflect the reality was there any uh, implementation of the Constitution as No, I mean, this, this is a tremendous DK document. I have, I've seen it before. It's, it's, don't speak playfully about it. In other words, don't tell the people this whole thing is a facade and a joke, because just keep quiet about it. Although, it is a facade and a joke. That's what they're saying. This is not something, this is not a genuine, but it will please people overseas. It will keep things, it will make us look orderly and allow us to proceed in the way we want to proceed. And that makes it, I think, a very typical uh, document from the top. Uh, the National Assembly, as far as we know, uh, convened once uh, and under Nguyen Chia's uh, guidance. Now, it's hard to imagine that, uh, you know, some of these members of the Central Committee came trooping in in the clothes of their factory uniforms or their, uh, or their rubber plantation uh, gear uh, and sat there and listened to uh, I mean, the assembly consists of, there's a lot of high-ranking cadre in the National Assembly. It's hard to think that they would have trooped in with everybody else if it met. But the point is, it did meet once, we think. There's some evidence that it did. Document it then adjourned. It was never brought back to, uh, never reconvened. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this document says, you know, don't worry about it. If you've heard something about it, you know, just be discreet. Don't say, it, don't say it doesn't exist, don't say it's useless, don't Thank you. And one final um, uh, subject on, on, on the Constitution um, so far as it relates to the establishment of bodies. Um, you, you've helpfully uh, referred already now to um, a session of the Presidium of the State of Democratic Cambodia. Um, there is a document on the case file which records a conference of the legislature of the People's Representative Assembly. This is document E3 slash 165. Um, if Or rather, I'll, I'll just take a step back before I show you that document. Um, um, just go back to the decision of the 30th of March, which is E3 slash 12, uh, and see, look at decisions that are reported there about certain things. Um, so this is E3 slash 12, um, the relevant ERNs in Khmer 00003141, in English 00182813 214, and in French 00224366. This was uh, discussed uh, by Judge Cartwright, uh, or you were asked questions by Judge Cartwright yesterday. Um, what I would like to do is, if we can show that the, the uh, relevant passage on the screen, and just look at uh, those, those appointments or those reported appointments uh, briefly, we could have that command document on the screen. Uh, Professor, you already have a copy of, of the decision. Yeah, it's, it's ready, so the AV unit could assist us. Um, the passage uh, essentially starts with the heading, the actual organization, um, as for the assembly, 
uh, it uh, indicates the methods, uh, or rather it states, uh, quote, the methods and regime of work as follows. Uh, one, all representatives, in fact, live with their people on into the future. The standing, number two, the standing committee of the People's Representative Assembly of Kampuchea, Chairman Comrade Nguyen, First Deputy Comrade Pim, Second Deputy Comrade Mok. Then below that, on the appointment of the Presidium of State, Chairman Comrade Hem, First Deputy Chairman Pen Nguyen, on the government, uh, just looking at the, uh, that section, the government, quote, must be totally an organization of the party directly of our state. The wish is for it to be strong, must have influence in the party, in the country, outside the country, with friendly countries and with enemies. The government appointments there are Comrade Paul as First Minister, Comrade Van as Deputy Prime Minister for Foreign Affairs, Comrade Vaughan. Deputy Prime Minister for Economics and Finance, and Comrade Q, Deputy Prime Minister for National Defence. If we start there with the last body, um, if you could tell us who those four individuals are, Comrade Paul. Uh, certainly, uh, just to, to preface, so it's interesting and it's amusing in a way that the Standing Committee of the General Assembly is also members of the Standing Committee of the CPK, this Tamok uh, and uh, Sapam and Nunchia. So you've almost. Could, anyway, the second one, uh, uh, first, uh, Paul is, uh, is Paul Pot, uh, Van is Yang Sri, uh, Von is Von uh, Vet, and uh, Q is uh, Q Sipon. That's it, those four. Uh, I just want to, for the avoidance of, of doubt, uh, um, on that last, last one, Comrade Q. No, Q is Son Sen, I'm sorry, no wrong. Defense, Q is Son Sen. Uh, Q, Q, I'm sorry. Thank you, just want to... No, uh, my mistake. Uh, you some you certainly, out. certainly. In, in subsequent uh, mm. examination. Um, um, now, and the chairman of the Presidium of State uh, indicated as Comrade Hem. Uh, do you understand that to, to be? Yeah. If, if you could repeat your answer for the. Record. I'm sorry, Kyu Sampon. Were there any other. Uh, senior so people that, that you are aware of based on your research in that, that group that we're looking at or more broadly um, um, within the CPK uh, hierarchy uh, who had the same um, alias Hem? Not that I know of. That, no, that's a name he used. I think he admits it in his autobiography and so on. I think this is quite well known. <coughs> Th thank you. Um, now, I, I will now return to that um, uh, document on the conference of the legislature that I mentioned earlier, E3-165. Um, we have obviously a Khmer version of that document, it is the original version, and if that could be displayed on the screen, the ERN for this passage starts at 00053634, that was the Khmer ERN. The English ERN is 00184068, and the French ERN 00301354. Uh, that's the beginning of the of the section. Um, now this document is dated the or he reports uh, a conference held uh, on the 11th to the 13th of April 1976. I don't propose to um, again go through uh, names other than to um, perhaps just point to the uh, people that we're concerned with primarily. Um, it looks at the or rather the assembly uh, approves the selection and appointment of the presidium with uh, Comrade Q. Sampan as chairman. He then goes on to, uh, under heading six, 
that deal with the selection and appointment of the government of Democratic Kampuchea. And there again we see Pol Pot, Ingsiri, Vaughan Vett and Son Sen in the positions that you uh, looked at earlier. And after that there is um, an, an appointment of or rather a, a, an assignment of a number of committees uh, answerable to the Deputy Prime Minister for Economics, Vaughan Vett. Um, Professor, what, if any, conclusions can be drawn from the fact that um, whilst the Assembly report indicates that the Assembly had Detail, had, had had detailed discussions and decided on these matters on the 11th of, to the 13th of April 1976. Um, given that, as we saw on the 30th of March, um, it appears appointments uh, along very similar lines uh, were made by the standing, or rather the Central Committee. Uh, what if any conclusions can be drawn from, from, from that, that from, the, from the events as they reported in by the documents? I would say clearly that the uh, appointments were not made uh, as a result of discussions inside the Assembly. The decisions were made as if this Assembly meeting really did go on for that period of time. The uh, appointments were made, uh, no, the appointments were ones that were agreed on by the Assembly having been presented to them by higher ups. That's the way it worked. It wasn't, they didn't push the proposals up. The proposals came down toward them. That's the significance of your two, your two dates. It's an interesting way of looking at it. 30, 30, and this is what's going to happen, and they say something else happened. It's not. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. ចាប់ពេលពេលនេះទៅទៅរហូតដល់ម៉ោង